you guys know how it goes at this point. I play an interesting online game in a weird opening. I then analyze it for you guys to watch and maybe go, huh, that's kind of a cool opening. I might give that a go. I'm going to talk you through the, you know, like themes of the opening. I'm going to pretend like I know what I'm on about. And then you guys are going to try it out and probably lose immediately because I gave you horrible advice. And if that sounds like something you want to do on a daily basis, then hey, you should check out my daily videos. So without further ado, the gentleman in the thumbnail alongside the not so good looking guy in a tank top is a man by the name of Perk. I think that's how you like, say it. Bloke in the, I think, late 1800s, early 1900s you know, top chess player, and he came up with the perk defense being d6 on move two. Normally, the perk defense goes something like this, and you get this kind of position, and I normally go for pawn f3 to stop the knight from attacking my bishop, because the point is to try and build up a battery and trade these bishops off. But this is the main line, and you know, perk players know this. So instead, I thought, huh, let's give b3 a go. And I like pulling out this kind of strategy in a few openings. So instead of getting my light squared bishop out, I actually just play d3 to support my pawn. And it looks like I'm a five-year-old just putting all my pawns on light squares. And um, I, I can't exactly deny that I quite like the aesthetic value of it, but the point is that I'm going to get my bishop on this long diagonal. Eventually, there's a good chance that we end up trading bishops, and I'm going to try and argue that my opponent losing his dark squared bishop is a bigger problem than me losing my dark squared bishop, and that it will leave too many holes in the black position. Also, playing in this manner takes your opponent out of theory. Because this is not theory. This is not a real opening. Like, <laughs> this is just some random thing I came up in a came up with in a blitz game. I've played a similar sort of thing a few times. I've played it against the Sicilian before, so essentially the same thing, but with c5 on the board, and you just build up this light square pawn chain. And the problem, the the, the reason why this doesn't get played with white is because where is this bishop going? Now. The computer, the reason it gives f4 as a mistake is because it wants g3 and putting the bishop on this diagonal. But I want to go for a kingside attack, you know, throw my pawns forward, castle queenside, and being kept with my bishop doesn't exactly go along with that. So I go for f4, and my idea is to put the bishop on e2 to support this diagonal, which is where I want to put my pawns anyway for my attack, you know, not every single piece has to be absolutely amazing in your position. This is a great piece for me because it complements the fact that my pawns are on light squares and f4 helps to control e5, which means my bishop can keep its diagonal open. But here my opponent helps me out with bishop g4. <clears throat> it attacks my queen. But it allows me to go bishop to e2 and secure this trade. Here I take with the queen because I want to put my knight on f3, not really e2. I don't really want the knight on e2 because I want the knight to jump in like this. And this helps me because I've got all these pawns on light squares and I get rid of my light squared bishop. There could have been ideas of going g3, bishop h3 to try and trade it along the long diagonal. But I was intent on putting the bishop on e2 to support my pawns, like I mentioned. So this helps my position because my opponent has set up a bit of a dark squared complex with d6. And a co common breaks in the perk are normally c5 against d4. But I don't have a pawn on d4 or e5, which would break against f4. So with my opponent having his pawns on dark squares, this light squared bishop would have been useful. So he continues playing in typical perk style, putting the knight like this to support the dark squares. I go knight f3, we have c6, again another idea, 
normally to try and support b5 and a5 because white typically castles queenside which is what I do after knight b d2 not c3 because I don't want to block my bishop scope instead I go to d2 because I want to keep the diagonal open right that is th this is my best piece so you know I want to make sure it stays as my best piece my opponent castles I castle apparently it's a mistake to be fair, I could probably just ignore castling for now and start throwing pawns down the board. But the reason I castle is because after queen a5, king b1, defending a2, and b5, knight g5, I'm trying to provoke h6 here. Because um, I want to go g4, and playing knight g5 means my queen controls g4. Because if I just go h5, my opponent's going to... Sorry, if I go h4, my opponent's going to play h5. And he's got a good grip on g4. But I also played this move to try and provoke h6. And I just drop my knight right back. And I'm like, bro, this is not good. This is not good for you. Because the g6 pawn is weakened. Because this pawn is advanced. And I'm going to try and take advantage of that. Oh, wow. Why? Okay, battery saver apparently. I forgot to um, turn my laptop charger on. That should be fine now though. <laughs> um, sorry about that. So, what was I saying? Yeah, g6 is weak. And I want to try and play moves like f5 in the future to try and undermine this pawn. So queen c7 is played because my opponent needs to break on the queen side. So he's going for a5, a4. But my structure is actually quite stable because, okay, I go rook dg1, which is why I castled queenside, because I wanted these rooks on this file so that g4 was supported by the rook and my queen didn't have to be tied down to that square so she could remain um, nice and flexible and try and get on different diagonals or double up in the future with a rook. So a5 g4, a4, and I'm not actually very worried about my queen side, because let's imagine that after g5, knight h5, um, I don't know, just for the sake of argument, my opponent gets this sort of thing and gives me a check. He can't make use of the a1 square to make my king, because my bishop controls a1. And I always have the option of dropping this knight back to b1 if need be. So even though it looks really scary with this battery, I do have adequate defense in a lot of positions, right? This is just for demonstration purposes. This isn't a line that I would actually play. So I'm just like, bro, you do your thing. Here I take on g7, which... I kind of have to do because I can't really let him take me. Say I play this, I can't really allow this because not only does f4 hang, but it's a bit scarier for my king when he takes on b3. And the computer's screaming for b4, just trying to do anything to keep the a file closed. My king's just a bit more vulnerable on b2. Than it is on b1. I, I mean, just visually, it looks a bit more vulnerable, but practically, I couldn't really tell you why, in all honesty. It's just like a theme of these um, systems where you fiend keto and then castle queen side. Often, you don't want to be the one to like recapture if your opponent uh, fiend ketos as well. Normally, you want to leave your king on the back rank, just because it's a bit safer. But anyway, I take, which is the only good move. The only move that maintains a non-losing position, basically. My opponent takes, and I take on h6. The computer calls it an inaccuracy, even though, if you can see the um, computer lines here, like I can, it is literally the favourite move. Okay, second favourite move. Okay, whatever. 
it makes very little difference. And here, my opponent needs to do one of these moves and use his pawn as an umbrella pawn, right? Because I effectively have shut down the h file by leaving this pawn on h6. And if my opponent just doesn't take it, the h file is forever shut. But I'm not worried because I've got moves like f5, like I mentioned before, trying to play against this weak pawn and open up the g file. But my opponent takes, which makes my task a bit easier. I go f5. Again, the computer calls it a miss. It's its second favorite move. It prefers queen to g2, which makes sense because the knight can't take on f4 because of queen g5 check, and that's just a simple fork. Admittedly, I didn't consider that, which is part of the reason that I played f5, because I wanted to make sure there was nothing with knight to f4, and also open up the diagonal for my queen to maneuver into the position with tempo on the king. We have rook h8, which is losing. My opponent needs to take on b3, really. He really needs to try and take on b3 and start something on the queen side. And that's what I was expecting, because I'm not actually threatening anything here. If he takes on b3, I'm going to have to take back. After a move like queen a7, queen d2 check, king goes back. Well, okay, probably there to avoid this coming with check. If I take here, there, there. There is there is a lot of counterplay in this position for black. And I have to be very accurate here to maintain my advantage. I have to go, I have to find queen c3 check. Ah, just controlling a1. Because black's trying to remove this knight which is controlling a1. Also giving my king the d2 square. There's no guarantees that I find this sequence of moves. There's also no guarantee my opponent finds that sequence of moves. Because he plays rook h8. The idea, I assume, is to retreat the king to g7. And use this rook as a defensive piece. But it's just a bit too slow. In opposite side castling positions, a lot of the time. You do just need to ignore the threats on your king. And just go for the enemy's throat. And worst comes to worst, maybe you can get a um, repetition of checks and a draw if, like this, the position is looking pretty dire for your king. And that's why I'm ignoring all this on the king on the queen side because I'm thinking that I just need to go for my opponent. He doesn't have anything quick enough to make me need to worry. So I take on g6. He takes back. I go queen e3 check. King g7, queen g5. This is just a fork. I'm forking g6 and e7. This rook is also essential to be defending the knight because if the rook, let's just say it moved for whatever reason, I can take on g6 and mate him, but for the sake of argument, the knight is also hanging because this is a pin. So here I was expecting knight to f8, which defends the pawn opens up the queen's defense of this pawn and maintains the rook's defense of that knight. And it's a horrible position, obviously, for black. I was planning knight to h4 here to, again, threaten to take. But also there's ideas of knight here check because the pawn's pinned, remember. So that was my plan, and this is what I expected. But despite my opponent being a very good player and also having still two minutes on the clock, he takes 20 seconds and plays rook h6. And the best move here is still knight h4, actually. But I keep it simple and just go, bro, you hung a pawn. And that's an important pawn, because this knight is pinned to the queen. This king is now forced to the back rank, which kind of strands this rook, because where's that rook going? This pawn is very, very weak. And this knight is also going to struggle to get back into the game. I'm simply up a pawn, but my attack is crushing. After, there's basically one move that completely wins here. Well, there's two moves that are very winning, but one move I feel like is very, very simple. 
I'm sure a lot of you are screaming for it. And it's knight g5. Now, I really like this move because it threatens a very simple fork. I'm just threatening to win the exchange. But it also stops rook to h7 because that's mate. Because my knight now controls the h7 square. The king also can't really run away. There's moves like queen e6 check. And he can't go to f8 because that's mate. So he's going to have to go back. And then knight f7 all the same. Forks the king and the rook. So knight g5 just wins. My opponent goes rook f8. And his point is that he's going to sack the exchange. And try and fight on in this position. Which is probably the best fighting chance my opponent has. We have takes takes. Queen d8. Getting out of this pin so the knight can move. But g6 is hanging. There was no way for my opponent to defend it. Like he cannot defend this pawn. Because knight f4 I control that square. And he couldn't go knight e5. Because it's pinned to the queen. Knight e5 would have been. You know. If, if, if he could play it. And I couldn't take the queen. He's still losing. He's still losing. But at least he's not losing the g6 pawn. Because the problem is after he does. This knight is stranded. The rook is stranded. We exchange. But I'm up the exchange. And these knights do not work well together. Because the king is way too weak. We have knight g7. And here I calculate. Rook g1. Queen defend. Now the queen can't really go to g8 because I can force a trade of queens, which I'm going to do every day of the week because I'm up an exchange and like two pawns. So my opponent needs to try and avoid a queen trade as well. So queen f8, queen h6, only move is king g8. And here, can you guys find the most simple way to win? Simplest move. Queen e6, check on the king, attack on the knight, and the knight can't take the queen because it's pinned. If my opponent moves his king, then I'm just going to win the knight on d7. So he's forced to offer me a queen trade here. He, he has no choice. And yes, I can take the d6 pawn, but I can also just take the queen. It's very simple. King takes. And here again. I try and be accurate. I bring the knight in. To stop ideas of knight e5. Which could be a source of counterplay. We have knight e6. Because I'm trying to stop my opponent's pieces from getting into the position. Because knights can be tricky in the end game. Right? It's not simple to win this. Like it should be easy. But not simple if you get what I mean. So knight f3 I feel like is really really accurate because it doesn't allow knight e6. It stops this knight's forward movement. If he goes to c5 then I can bring the knight to d4 and I can win this pawn. So and obviously if he comes to e5 I'm just going to exchange with him. And this knight's forward movement is cut off. Because if he goes to e6, then knight g5, and I force a trade, which of course I want to do. So we have takes, takes, king f6, and what I think is the most accurate move here, rook g8. Because he can't defend his pawns, I'm going to come in from behind. I also cut the king off from trying to stop this pawn. So realistically, this knight gonna have to sacrifice itself for the pawn at some point and it's just very easy very easy to win this i know it's completely winning i know it was completely winning like 10 moves ago but it's online blitz anything can happen especially with knights so you still want to be as accurate as you possibly can and here my opponent resigns because for the reasons that i just laid out it's completely hopeless for black so yeah hopefully you guys found that interesting Maybe you'll give this system a go. I don't think it has an actual name. Maybe I should trademark it or something. But I don't think I will. I don't think I will. Um, objectively, 
it isn't the best, of course, because the objective best lines are the main lines. Like, we've figured all the main lines out by now. And the problem within that is that everyone knows the main lines. So you're not going to get particularly great positions in most cases. You're going to have to sort of play like 15, 20 moves of theory and then play some really weird nuance on move 17. I don't want to play like that. I don't like studying openings. I want to play some weird off the opening that I can understand the ideas of, not necessarily the exact move order, but the ideas, and outplay my opponent because they've never seen it before. Right? That's how I like to play chess. A bit more chill. It takes actual skill, and I don't have to treat it like a job and study theory all the time, which is boring. It's just, it's just, it's just boring. Like, this is far easier to learn, far easier to implement, and it's way more fun in my opinion. So if you guys stuck around till the end, thank you so much. I've been getting so much support on the channel recently. It is so cool. It's really fun. I've been really enjoying it. So yeah, if there's any kind of videos you want me to do, please just drop a comment and I reply to every comment. So you're guaranteed a response. And until the next video, which is tomorrow because I post daily, have a good one.